So our next speaker is here from uh, Switzerland. You know, Stefan is definitely known in the community. He does a lot of stuff. Uh, I met him again at this DEF CON this year. I've met him a couple of times already. He keeps telling me Swiss chocolate is better than Belgian chocolate, but don't believe him. <laughs> yeah, it's a mixed opinions in the room, I see. Mixed yeah, opinions, mixed opinions, all right. He will give the same talk as he gave in uh, 2009. 11. 11, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but he's a pen tester and the talk will be about pen testing as well, I think. Um, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same, so I'm curious to see how it turns out. Hope you like it. Thank you so much. Wow. Right, so 130 BPM is a healthy resting heart rate, right? <laughs> no, um, I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited about about this particular talk, um, especially because of the concept of retro talks. It's great for me to be back after such a long time. Uh, Brucon to me always feels like coming home, even if I'm just here as an attendee. Even more so, um, being able to present something that I did such a long time ago. Um, the road to Brucon for me was a bit rocky, so. I got the confirmation of the talk like long ago and I started actually preparing against my usual instincts. I started preparing those slides, like the updated slides fairly early. So we got about 60, 70% done and then I sort of started slacking. And about a, yeah, a month ago, I was like, yeah, I'm going to finish those slides. And then I came down with the stomach flu and I was like, okay, that's crap. I'm going to spare you the details. And then I was getting better and I was like, okay, cool, let's, let's do that. The weekend was coming around, two weeks left approximately, no, three weeks left before BrewCon. And then like I had a migraine. <laughs> I was like, cool, two of the three. And then last week I ended up with a severe uh, flu, so that's why my voice is still not entirely back. But I'm happy to have actually made it here to Ghent to present this and I hope you enjoy it and I hope you can have a discussion about this. So, this is me. Um, I was introduced by a dinosaur, a dragon, Godzilla. I don't know the official specification here. Um, this is my sort of professional background in a nutshell. Um, my way into this community and into this industry is very similar to a lot of people my age that still work in this industry. Um, I was super into computers as a child growing up, um, much to the dismay of my parents who owned the computers I was tinkering with. Um, I was part of the local scene. Uh, I grew up in a sort of undisturbed yet very slow internet and um, I was really interested in information security. I studied IT and I joined a small consulting company in the early 2000s that a bunch of people I've met before uh, actually founded. That would be skipped there. Now, um, yeah, it's almost 2020 and I'm still with them. I actually own part of the company and our main business to this day is penetration testing. So this is a topic close to my heart. Um, I'm also quite involved with uh, our local DEF CON chapter in Switzerland, DC 4131. Uh, we run monthly meetups, stuff like that. Uh, so if you're in the area, please drop by, that would be cool. In this capacity, I'm also one of the organizers of Area 41, another conference. I'm not going to advertise for the uh, sort of the competition here, but it's happening again in 2020. So if you want to drop by, that would be cool. And probably most relevant for this particular talk is my involvement with the penetration testing execution standard, short PTES, which was a motion that we sort of started to do um, in. I don't actually remember, I think that was about 10 years ago because a lot of us were fed up with a lot of problems regarding taxonomy and sort of what a pen test should entail. And that was also the source of inspiration that like sort of came to, um, came as the source of inspiration for this presentation that I gave. It has actually been over 2,500 days since I gave this presentation in Brussels at the location with over 9,000 entrances. 
uh, to put that into perspective, when I actually gave this talk, um, everybody was super stoked for the release of this device. Yeah, it's the iPhone 4S. It came out in October, just after the conference. Also, as a small reminder, um, the, the exact day I gave this presentation was the day the US Army ended its don't ask, don't tell policy, which goes a long way to show you that we were really living in a very different time back then. Um, as a visual sort of comparison to when that happened, To be fair, that was kind of the reaction I was going for. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. Okay, let's dive in. So, the presentation uh, is, was called, and is still called, the 99 cent heart surgeon dilemma, which, uh, in retrospect, is not the most um, uh, transparent title to tell you what it is all about. Uh, and when I was going back to look at the slides, I realized that. And I realized also that I knew that back then, because that was the first slide that I presented, where I explained to people like what this is going to be about. And what it was about is that I was at the time very frustrated, again, with the taxonomy of penetration testing. Like we as a company, but also in like conversations with colleagues, I did often realize that people would say pen test, but they would mean Nessus scan. Or, you know, they would say pen test, but they would mean compliance check. They would like, there's just different, like, um, sort of understanding of what this, this, this word is supposed to mean. And to me, that was super frustrating because I frequently ran into conversations with potential customers that were like, well, but you're twice as expensive as the other company. And it was like, yeah, that's because they suck. And because all they do is push a button, and that's only really what we want to do. So, um, uh, if I had to give this talk a name today, I would probably call it "Improving Penetration Testing," which I think is a bit more telling. But like, yeah, I had this slide in there where I sort of was making the connection. Do people still know who Gregory D. Evans was? No. Good. <laughs> There's one guy over there. That's great. Um, so the entire premise of the talk, or how I, how I created the talk, was um, I was working on the penetration testing ex execution standard. I was um, mostly working on reporting. So what I did is I reached out to customers of mine, and I asked them if they could share um, examples of reporting that they got from their, from their pen test companies. And I didn't expect a lot of response. I told them from the get-go, you can redact whatever you want, just tell me why it stands out for you, and we'll sort of make it work. And you can send me really good stuff that you felt like this is excellent, this should be like a role model for other people, and you can send me stuff that is just ridiculous and you think, you know, it should never happen again. Um, I should have foreseen this, but 80% of what I got back was just utter crap. <laughs> like, I didn't get a lot of, like, well, look at this great report. I got just the stuff that people were really annoyed about. So I, I looked at all of that, and, and just to put this in perspective, we're talking about 5,000 plus pages of documentation that I got mostly in digital form, but some of it was also physical. And it was just the most unbelievable crap in there and I decided to do a presentation on it because I need a group therapy so to speak so <laughs> this was and this is a talk about bad examples I want to go a bit further than that today in this revised edition but I'm still going to share the examples because they're funny so uh, when I said before that a lot of the stuff that I got was uh, in digital form I didn't foresee this package that I got with free annual reports. When I say reports, like, those are very long NASA scans with a custom logo on them. Like, make no mistake, like, this is not something that was very quality-wise uh, standing out. And there was, like, this bit in there where I was like, well, there are really companies out there 
that like do stuff like that. That was my that was one of the first things that I read, and I was really frustrated about that. And I thought like, well, maybe it's a quirk. And if if the company delivered outstanding work, like content-wise, it would have been probably okay. I would have been willing to swallow this pill of having to pay for a PDF. But it was not. So that was a good first uh, <laughs> entry into like this study of uh, reports. Um, when you looked into some of the reports, um, this, this is actually a crowd favorite. And let me quickly ask, like out of the people in this auditorium, has anyone of you seen the original talk in 2011? It's you, two, three, four, okay, cool. Um, okay, the usual thing I get when I talk about this talk is like, yeah, right, bombs. Uh huh, I see you grinning. And that's because of this. Um, this was a pen test report issued by a German company that does not exist anymore. And um, it was about the cross-site scripting vulnerability they found. And in this like reporting bit, there were like those four wingdings or webdings, I don't know, bombs. And my immediate question was like, what the hell does that mean? Like, I mean, I had a hunch, like, it's probably some sort of severity or something like that. And I actually asked a bunch of people, I actually asked during the, um, during the presentation, like, can anybody tell me conclusively what this means? And so far, nobody has, has gotten it wrong. But if anybody wants to try that wasn't in the original presentation, be my guest. Anyone? What are bombs for? Just shout it out. It's fine. Yeah, severity, but what, on, on what scale? Is it one to three, four out of three, eh, one to five? Like, you could, like, my guess was, yeah, it's some sort of impact metrics uh, <laughs> probably translates in, in some way to, like, either CVSS or just low, medium, high, what do I know? So I went all the way through the report, and there, luckily there was like a chapter that was titled How to Read This Report, which is necessary. And here's the exact quote translated, and I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to peruse that. <laughs> right. It's like the Richter scale. Right. <laughs> I think enough time has passed since 2011, so we don't really have to have the conversation as why this is horseshit. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Um, this is an actual example, but this is less funny, but it's a more prevalent topic that was very visible throughout a lot of these reports, um, and that's just bad visualization of actually relevant, important data. Um, I think this is a great example because there is more than meets the eye. Like, the first thing that you see here is that this person has never read a book by Edward Tuft, and he really should, because 3D graphics are a crime against humanity and should never be done. Um, the second thing is like, if you are a security officer and you are getting a report with 1,400 low vulnerabilities, I really have all the sympathy in the world for you because it's just banner grabbing, uh, information disclosure, oh my god, there is a HTTP trace function enabled, ah, oh, it's, it's not great. But the most, and the most subtle thing here is that given this metric, and I can't tell you the number anymore actually because it's so obscure, but if you look at the red bar, that's actually a double digit number. Like this pen test company found a double digit number of vulnerabilities they consider to be highly critical. And I looked at the specific vulnerabilities. They were like stuff you should really fix. They were nonsense. But if somebody in like upper management gets this graph and is supposed to make sense of this and make a budget decision or make a strategy decision, that's not just not going to happen because it's all green. It's all great. We don't have any problems. More stuff. Um, this was from an engagement that ran for over a week. 
And this was the core takeaway of their, um, of their report. And apparently there was no communication between like the kickoff date and the, the report delivery. And like at least half of you already know what's happening here, right? I was close. <laughs> nope, but good guess. Like somebody made a typo. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you're entertained, but I would be pissed. <laughs> and what baffles me, like, I'm going to be completely honest with you, like, I have mistyped IP ranges more than I'm willing to admit. Um, but usually you, you, you notice or you get like a hunch that maybe something is wrong when nothing in the target range actually responds or maybe you know you have conversation with the customer you're like, hey, is this supposed to look like that? You mentioned the web server or something like that. So that just didn't happen. Again, we're talking about bad examples, right? So let's go on. But there's more. I'm going to summarize those um, because I think it's going to take up too much time otherwise. Uh, there was a number of people who didn't bother to remove other customers' names when they were copy-pasting things. That's, that's just golden. General copy-paste stuff that was weird and just shows you like that people were like stealing stuff from other reports and plagiarizing themselves. You know when you get those emails, like those sales pitches or like all sorts of like um, recruitment stuff and it's like that little blob of text and it says, dear name and like the name is in a different font and you just know that he just pasted in Stefan and hit send. It's like, it's like that. And again, a lot of uh, just spruced up Nestos reports, um, a lot of vulnerability scanner output just sold for five digit numbers of cash. Um, some are a bit more elaborate and try to like hide the fact that it's just uh, output from a scanner. Some just just post it like that. Um, nowadays, I think we are facing a similar problem in AppSec with burp scanner output at some points. Like I've heard that recently, so we're really making the same uh, sort of fucked up mistakes again. Uh, am I allowed to curse? Yeah, I think so. Cool. <laughs> So yeah, and then we just have like pen testers um, that were just beaten by very, very rudimentary obstacles that um, defenders put in their way. Um, people who couldn't finish a port scan because of fail to ban, because their NMAP scripts were to run into it. It's a good example, for example. Um, um, one of my personal favorites is uh, Web Labyrinth, which um, in a nutshell creates, it's a tool by Ben Jackson, I believe, and in a nutshell what it does it is it creates an infinite number of sub-websites in a particular folder, almost like bombs. Um, and um, it's just like, it's just a rabbit hole that is recursive, it doesn't end, that there are always new unique URLs, so if you send a spider to like sort of spider this directory, it will just never end. So if you're a shitty uh, Pentest company and all you can do is run a scanner against the website, it's not going to finish. Which led to that gem here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <sighs> I know this is funny. I know, like, that's why I included it in the updated talk. Like, I, it's funny to look at other people and it's funny to um, sort of um, assume that we all don't make mistakes and that we all can do everything just better. But I think things are not quite that easy. Um, like, um, I actually wrote this myself uh, about a year ago. And I was looking at my slides and I was like, well, 2011 me didn't really listen to 2017 me, right? So I want to try to finish this talk or like to use the rest of the time I have in this talk to steer this in a bit more of a constructive uh, direction. There are still some examples coming up, but like, let's see where these things come from and why they are so problematic. One of the major changes in my own thinking in those years ever since I gave the talk was that back then my main thought or my main 
So the theory was that there are just a lot of shitty companies that are trying to make money off of people who don't know better. By now, I think that this is actually just a small part. Like, yeah, we have charlatans out there, we have people ripping up the people off, but I don't think that's the most relevant bit. Hanlon's Razor says, never attribute to malice, uh, that which is adequately explained by stupidity. I wouldn't use stupidity, but I would use unfortunate circumstances or also lack of experience and knowledge. So yeah, we do have we do have companies who act in bad faith. We do have companies who do not deliver on their promises of service. But we also have a lot of these cases, a lot of the examples that I showed before can easily be explained by people not having the experience or just the, the skills to actually perform the tasks they are supposed to perform. If you never learned how to work around uh, a firewall that is actively blocking your port scan, you're going to have a hard time because it worked every time so far and now it's not working anymore. And as a junior pen tester, it's not really your fault. I mean, you should get the training you require to do your job from your employer and you should be able to sort of like, you know, make this happen. And training is such a massive factor. Um, when, when Tom did the thing this morning, when he asked all of you to uh, sort of say if this is your first BrewCon, like 80% of the room was like, yes, this is my first BrewCon. And I talked to so many people at conferences lately that have entered the industry within the last two to three years. Like, we're constantly talking about the skill shortage or a skills gap in information security and yet we sort of don't acknowledge that people don't come pre-trained. And even with training, it's tricky. Because in my personal experience, like the only thing I could sort of state as a label of implied quality, at least technically, is the OSCP by offensive security. I'm not getting paid to say that, sadly. Um, but I had people coming in with other certificates. Um, one of them has hacker in its name. <laughs> and they consistently underperform in a very specific, easy to pinpoint way. So the way we do recruitment at Skip is we, uh, we run them through a series of challenges. We don't always use the same ones. Uh, if you want more details, there's a prolonged Twitter rant that you can peruse. Um, but anyway, the, the thing I noticed about that, about candidates with that particular certificate is that no matter what you would give them as a target object, be it a website, be it a client device, be it a, a server with network services running, they would always run and go and run uh, NMAP as their very first step. It's an automatism. It's like a taught automatism that just shows bad training and it shows a lack of creativity, which is hard to have as a pen tester. And then last but not least, uh, let's not neglect that there is in fact human error involved. And nobody's prone for that. You can do that job for five years, you can do that job for 10 years, and you're still going to mistype IP addresses now and then. You just learn to ask people twice if they have the right IP addresses. But yeah, let's talk about charlatans. Let's talk about the bad faith actors and get those out of the way so we can talk about more constructive things. One of the things that made me super happy when I was preparing this talk was that almost all the companies, like more than 70% of the ones I checked are not in business anymore. Like they don't last. Like, you don't pay an absurd amount of money for a bad pen test more than once, and work gets around really quickly. Um, I do a good chunk of my work in Switzerland, which, as you may know, is a very small country with a very small community, and you, it's, it's impossible to deliver the type of stuff that I showed before consistently over years and still have work. I'm sure that can vary for larger markets, of course, but again, the evidence that I have at this point shows that most of them don't make it for too long. And if you don't want to make the mistake once by running into like one of these bad actors, um, what you can do is you can avoid them. And it's not actually that hard. It's not that hard to avoid them. You can ask them about their procedures and standards. 
if you're looking for a web application penetration test and you're talking to a pen test company that doesn't know what OWASP is, I mean, run. That's the only advice I can give you at this point. Um, what I really recommend if you're in the position to, to uh, if you're in the buyer's position is ask to talk to the pe testers that are going to do the work. And I say that specifically, that are going to do the work. Don't let them push like their poster child ahead and be like, yeah, he spoke at DEF CON and then like have some junior consultant do your, do your test afterwards. It doesn't really work. But when you get to talk to the testers, it gets a lot easier to sort of divide the good ones from the bad ones. Uh, one thing, uh, and I know that some people disagree with me on that. Um, I'm personally big on community participation. I think it shows a certain commitment to our trade and what we're doing. When you have people that uh, volunteer a chunk of their time, professionally or privately, to involve themselves in conferences like this or go to meetups or just foster knowledge exchange uh, on a personal level. And it's, it's my experience, I have helped people recruit pen testers in the past, it's my experience that these, um, the people that care about the community are usually the ones that deliver better results and better growth over a longer period of time. Um, a bit more conclusive is the, the bit about sample deliverables. I recommend um, that you look at those very closely. Um, I shouldn't be telling you this because I personally hate to prepare sample deliverables for my customers. It's one of my least favorite things to do. But it's super important uh, if you're in, in the buyer's role because it just helps you to evaluate what you're going to get and it also gives you something to, uh, to hold your uh, pen tester accountable to. When you get a sample report where every finding is detailed super nicely with like uh, mitigation actions and like super nice ratings and so on and your report doesn't look like that, that's something you can use to like build pressure and be like, hey, this is not what we agreed upon. So I really agree, I uh, really suggest that you do that. And yeah, if you're in a bias position and you're talking to a pen tester and you just don't feel right, be ready to walk away. There are so many companies doing penetration testing now. If it doesn't feel right for you, don't bother. It's fine. So let's go on the other side of the, of the spectrum for a second. Let's go to the attackers in, uh, and uh, the people actually doing the testing. How many of you do some sort of offensive work? Raise your hand, please. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I'm painting with a very broad brush here. But I think that this is true for a lot of people, at least, that I worked with. I think pen testers like puzzles. I think we actually want to do a good job. I think we want to exceed expectations. And we don't really like to be constrained in terms of scope or in, in terms of time. Like, I haven't met a pen tester in my time who said no to, hey, do you want more time? to spend on this, on this project, on this particular asset. We like to actually experiment longer. And one thing that I observed with my own employees actually is, um, there's always this scoping discussion about like testing hours, like when are you allowed to test a specific asset? And we still have a lot of customers, especially in newer ones, that are like, yeah, well, you need to tell us when you start testing, and you need to tell us when you stop testing, and it needs to be during office hours because we need to be able to react if you break something in our network. And you're like, well, we're testing externally and that stuff is on the internet 24-7, so you're being attacked 24-7, so what's your point? But that usually doesn't really connect for, for us over time that develops. But once you agree with the customer that you can test whenever you want for how long you want within a certain time frame, I have seen people doing over time without even mentioning it just to finish exploiting that one bug that they f thought might be somewhere. I've met people at the office at 10 p.m. in the evening be like, yeah, I'm just that close to a shell. I'm just that close. Pentesters are very odd people. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, it, it really works that way. So we like this freedom and we want to do a good job. So when we're scoping penetration tests, we should look at the needs of everyone involved. We should 
create a setting that allows testers to do the best work and we should create a setting that allows customers to get the best possible results. So let's for a second go back to the bias mindset once more. And this is such a crucial question that will lead us to one of the massive core points. Why do people actually buy pen tests? The classic one, or the one that people at least mention is like, yeah, we want to identify vulnerabilities and close them before somebody else does. But what is true in a lot of cases is just like somebody else is making them buy pen tests. Like a boss is telling them that they have to get a pen test done for some regulatory requirement. Compliance wants a report so they can check a checkbox. Maybe, and that's the more reasonable uh, things in my opinion, maybe you want to specifically test your, def your defensive capabilities. Maybe you want to see how your defensive team would fare in a real your tr uh, attack that is sort of relevant to your friend model. But these are very different setups. And these are the things that we need to sort of account for when we plan these. So I said that at the very beginning, I think the core that led to all those bad examples that I showed you before is taxonomy. We need to know what people want when they say, I need a pen test. And I found this very great graphic here. Um, the, didn't do this myself, the credits is on the right side and also on the slide, but I think it's very fitting so I didn't bother recreating it. I think this is such a good example of to show what it can mean and where it goes to. And it also shows that like none of the things on this slide is wrong. Like all of those have legitimate reasons why you could run those. If you're investing a ton of money and a ton of effort into code reviews and architecture reviews, and you just need to get a vulnerability scan done to get compliance off your back, that's fine. Like it's fine to run an SS scan, just pay, don't pay somebody 10K for it. But it's fine to run an SS scan, it's fine to do that if your priorities are somewhere else. Maybe you invest, if you're investing all that money into building an SDLC that really works, maybe you don't have the funds and you don't have the capacity to run a full-blown red team exercise at the same time. And maybe you shouldn't. So really it is all about scope. And this is where I'm going to preach on you for the rest of this talk because I think it's so, so, so important and it's going to make your life easier if you sort of heat this. When we did the p-test, we tried to, we didn't try to tell people how they're supposed to do penetration tests because as you said before, there are a lot of different ways how you can sort of scale this and sort of build this out. But I think it's super important to have sort of a guideline where everybody agrees on what are the potential options on how to perform an offensive or adversarial uh, testing module. And I think what we achieved with the p-test is that we actually did that. We did it to the point where it's adapted into PCI and where we have a common understanding what could constitute the single modules of a pen test. Uh, Mitra's attack is another great uh, resource and sort of matrix to get an idea of what could be part of an exercise you're running. It's particularly interesting if you're running red team attacks, it's less interesting if you're doing sort of smaller scope things, but it's still sort of uh, interesting to just look at that and see where you can go with this. And sometimes it's not that important what you report. Sometimes it's more important that you actually have a common understanding on what you want to achieve. So what I experienced a lot during the last couple of years where we um, ran a lot of larger scale exercises is the more you collaborate with your customers and the bigger your assessments get, the less relevant the reports get. So what we did for a, a bunch of Swiss banks now is simulated attacks over a six to eight month period. And we, we scoped them together with the customer. We defined the rules of engagement together with the customer. And we went to the point where we had 
people from the customer's blue team sit out of the blue team for months at a time with a sort of internal NDA and sit with us to, to help us attack and like use their capabilities, not like insider knowledge, but just like to tag along and ride along with us to see like, you know, how things work. And we ended up having like a, a very successful exercise and we spent about 30% of the budget after attacks ended. So we spent about 30% of all the time allotted to go through the various TTPs, do everything we used to achieve access, to exfiltrate data, to do all of these funky things that you do during a red team exercise and talk through them in detail with the blue team instead of reporting them in a form that somebody would or would not understand, we went through them with them. And in the end, yes, there was a report, but there was a report where everybody agreed on, everybody at the table agreed on before we actually finalized it. And then this report went to management. And it's incredible the difference you can see between a report that is disputed by a blue team and a report that is supported by the blue team, by compliance, by everyone that has a stake in a corporate entity security. Because if you're not going to make impact with any sort of offensive maneuver or any type of offensive exercise, just don't do it, like it doesn't make sense, like you need to create impact. So, if I had to summarize in one single slide on how we can improve or fix penetration testing, it's do it more openly, do it publicly, do it collaboratively. Don't go to a kickoff meeting, define the target, and then go into your little dark room and type away and hack away and then come out with a report in the end, but work with the customer. Work over a prolonged period of time, work with clearly defined scopes that allow for adaption as you go along and that allow the customer to do its share within this process. And with that, you can get much better results. When I, say about, uh, tell, when I tell you about communication, when you actually get to talk to management, when you actually get the chance to, to like communicate like vertically in an organization, maybe consider doing it in a way they understand. <laughs> and maybe don't do this, <laughs> which is another bit of an actual report that apparently never found any audience. <laughs> Because this is this isn't working. Like when you when you show people stuff like that, they it just doesn't connect. You need to talk risk. You need to talk exposure. You need to take talk money, preferably, and people will listen way more readily to you. So that's my almost 45 minutes. Uh, we have 15 minutes for questions if you want to. I'm also going to be at the mentor uh, event over at the hotel. So if you want to chat uh, more privately, feel free to do so. Otherwise, uh, shoot away with questions, and thank you so much for your attention. Anything? Anyone? On my way. Um, I think the graphic you showed about the, you know, what is a pen test was quite interesting. So one of the things we struggle as well with is defining what a vulnerability test is, what a pen test is, and what a red team is. Right. Um, so the clients have their own definitions, and most of it call, you know, they call them pen tests. Mm -hmm. But as a security person. Um, I'd be curious to know how would you differentiate between a pen test and a red team? Like you said, you do a pen test over six to eight months. So my, so my background is that. You know, I, I, I do work in information security, so I would have thought that would be something more like a red team. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd be curious to hear what would you define as a pen test versus a red team engagement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is the difference between a red team and a pen test engagement? That's, the question is like, does my definition really matter? Because there are as many definitions out there at this point as you can count. Um, 
personally, I would much rather have this talk with the client every single time when we start the exercise because in my experience what happens more often than not is that the customer comes with a, a term that he feels is right for him and I don't want to start with no. Like I don't want you to come in and be like, hey, I want to do a red team exercise and you tell me about it and I'm like, well, actually, that's not a red team exercise. I think that's a bad start for like any sort of like cooperation. I think you can point it out. You can be like, well, this is generally more on the scale of a pen test, but like, yeah. For me personally, just to answer the question nevertheless, um, my definition of red teaming includes uh, all domains. So it includes physical, uh, cyber, everything you can think of. And it also includes uh, social engineering by default. It also includes, as I said, physical like attempts to get into the premises like Sharon outlined it before with uh, the physical social engineering part. It just needs to be a really full scope and it also needs to be based on the actual threat model of the organization. Like I don't think a red team should look for technical vulnerabilities. Like for me a red flag, um, that tells me that somebody doesn't want the red team exercise is when somebody comes to me and tells me, hey, we want to see if you can do get domain admin. Like, nobody gives a shit about domain admin in business terms. Like, of course, it's your keys to the kingdom. That's great. But that's not, that's not a, a valid flag. Like, you, you're mostly looking for, for business data or for some way to interact with the business in a way that could be detrimental to their success or growth. And I think that's where I personally would draw the line. But again, I think my opinion really doesn't matter. More questions? God damn. Okay, now we're questions. Thank you. No. <laughs> Can you pass the mic, please? No. It will be much faster than I, I disagree with your comment regarding red teaming, but that's, that's fine. No matter. Uh, um, if if you could uh, specify one qualification uh -huh. or some yes, kind of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of measurement for a good pen test, whether that's Crest or Tiger Team, something that's global, what would you point at as this team knows what they're doing without having to have every company individually interview their pen testing team? Mm -hmm. I, I struggle with that question to this date because I think Crest, for example, is a great initiative, um, but my company isn't Crest certified. And What's stopping us from being Crest certified is that it's just too damn expensive for what it is. Like we have our reputation, we have our existing stock of customers, so for us it doesn't make sense. But if you're looking for a pre-qualifier, I think Crest is, is the reference I would go to personally. But if you have different recommendations with your background, I'm happy to hear them. It was a trick question. There's no right answer on that one. It's, for example, Crest certification is not big in certain areas. So outside of the UK, outside of Australia, uh, you can't necessarily find a Crest certified testing team in China or yeah. India. So yeah. yeah, but again, I think like no answer is no uh, is not a valid answer. Like you know, you want to clo get as close as it gets to something that has any shimmer of meaning, and I think that for some people that applies to Crest. But for some other people, if you're sitting in China, it maybe doesn't. Anyone else? So how much do you charge for pen testing? <laughs> for you? <laughs> I think there was one here. Yeah. So how, de how detailed do you think the recommendations in a report should be? I mean, do you give the really specific recommendations of how somebody should configure something? Or do you keep it more broad so they implement the thing that would be best for the company because they know the mm -hmm. domain much better than you do? Um, that really depends on the finding. If it's a super technical finding and some sort of like misconfiguration or it's also like maybe something that is um, 
uh, for example, like you know, you find the SQL injection in a web application. Like it's fairly straightforward. You can point to best practices, to all OWASP guides, and so on. And I think then it's it, it's fair and also recommended to give a specific recommendation. We've also sat down with developers and looked at their code and like sort of figured out the, the solution together with them. Um, but that has certain limits because if your finding is on a higher level, like you don't like you don't have any transparency with like what stuff is executed on your clients you don't see when i run mimikatz or any powershell stuff on your client the the solutions and the implementations thereof become much more complex and much more dependent on the target environment so there the workshops that we're having with customers become really, really useful because there you can really deep dive. In the report itself, I think at some point you need to have some sort of vagueness to avoid writing a book about Windows client hardening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone? Any takers? In the different scopes of the pen test on uh, on your customers, uh, what they uh, they demand more in terms of uh, web application pen testing or a real um, attack <laughs> simulation? Mm -hmm. uh, or I'm not sure if I understand the question yeah. correctly. Are you asking so, what so is more in demand for yes, us? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in in quantity wise it, clearly it's like it's a bread and butter stuff it's like appsec and so on but if you look at it on like project volume i think we're more on the red team side on the, the, the complex assessment side because if you have an assessment that runs over months at a time obviously that's a big of a bigger chunk um, but I try to have this balance because we're trying to enable new people to get into the industry as well. We hire people that don't have 10 years of experience as testers or not, don't have like a specific training, maybe come from general IT or have been like administrators before. And you just, you, you cannot expect somebody to jump into security and do like, you know, full on red team exercise from the get go. So we try to have a good mixture as it is. I think there was someone more before, but I'm not sure where it was. No? <laughs> okay, cool. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you at the mentor thing. <laughs> <laughs>